Great. Morning, everyone. Um, uh, the other day, my son came up to me and said, uh, Dad, can you fix anything? And I said, uh, uh, well, I'm pretty good. I can fix most things, but not anything. And then he goes, there is a man that can fix anything. And I said, oh, really? And he said, Doug. <laughs> And so I laugh quite a lot, but it's pretty true, really. <laughs> so thanks for your help, Doug, with everything. We got the thing. Just thought about that earlier. Um, we are taking a break from the morning series currently, and uh, we're going to jump ahead to Matthew 16. And it's it's quite a powerful passage that we're looking at with it, because Jesus asks a question in it that will change your life. Your your answer to this question will direct your life. Your answer to this question will make you think differently, act differently, do different things. How you spend your money. How you raise your kids. The answer to this question will change your life. And the thing is, is that we all have to answer it one day. We all have to come to a standing point in what we believe in this question. And the question is, what Jesus brought was, who do you say I am? Let's just have a quick pray before we get into the passage. Lord God, I thank you that you are at work. I thank you that you use us. I thank you that we're hearing great things about what you're doing here in our town and with our young people. I pray that you just speak through me today and that uh, you open hearts and that you are glorified, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's see if this clicker works. It always gives me hassles. Oh, there you go. It's a bit dark, I don't know. We'll see how we go. When Jesus came to a region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, Caesarea Philippi, as they were entering, it's got quite a high ground as you go in. So I can imagine it, they're looking over this vast land, and it was quite a religious area of the time. They had um, Baal worshippers there. They had Greek god of, uh, they worshipped Pan, the Greek god there. And um, Herod had just built this great temple um, in honor of August, Augustus Caesar. And so you can, you can imagine Jesus as he walks into this area, all these little like different shrines and different buildings and things. And it could have been in their conversation. And then Jesus goes, and starts a spot test with his disciples. I don't know if you guys had spot tests at your school when you grew up. Um, they were okay, I guess. Um, I did okay in them because I didn't really study when there wasn't much uh, time to study. It, it was what you knew right now, it's on the spot kind of questioning. And, and so I did okay with that instead of because I didn't study that much. But my point is, is that it's your reaction straight away. And Jesus asks his disciples right there, and he says, who do people say I am? And their response is quite easy, because they're talking about other people. They're going, well, people say, um, some say John the Baptist, or others say Elijah, or still others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. That basically, people think you're a holy man, or, or maybe you could be a holy man that's been raised from the dead. Or or, or a good teacher. Or a guy that God has used to do good things. A a good guy. And some people today think that of Jesus. They go, well, Buddha was a good guy. He taught well. He was very peaceful. Or, not, not, what am I saying? Not Buddha. Muhammad. And uh, they also say that about Jesus. Is that he, he was a good guy. We like him. He taught good stuff. He was a holy man. But then Jesus goes and puts it in their court. He goes, but what about you? He asks, 
who do you say I am? And I can imagine them getting a bit sweaty and going, oh man, like, I thought we were just having a relaxing walk and a chat here, you know? And it gets personal. It gets right at the point. The spot test gets right to the point. And I can see them, like, getting nervous and fidgeting and then looking to Peter, because Peter's, like, the loudmouth of the group. And so they're going, Peter, help us out. You take the fall if it's wrong. And uh, they look to Peter. And Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He says, you're not a prophet. You're not a good man. You, the prophets taught about you and said that you were going to be coming soon. They pointed the way towards you, the Christ, the one that we've been expecting. You're the guy. And he adds on to that. He doesn't just say, you're the guy. He says, you're the son of the living God. The God that is alive and active and real. You're not a statue that's just in a building or a shrine like those other gods. You're not just a, a holy man or a celebrity that can do cool tricks. You're the son of the living God. God. And he said, basically, he's going, you're God. You are God. And Jesus says, you're right. But you cheated on the test, because that's not your answer. <laughs> he goes, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, Jonah, for this is not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. He says, my father, that you just told me, the son, the living God, he's revealed it to you. Not anyone else. Your father is Jonah. My father is in heaven. And he's revealed that to you. And then we get to one of the most controversial bits of scripture throughout history. And it's nice to tackle that every now and again and to have a look at it. But your take on this passage, this little verse, can direct how you live out the answer to that question. You see, the key with this passage, well, let me read it first. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You are Peter. He gives them the name Peter, which is Petros. It means small stone or pebble. And then he goes and says, on this rock, Petra which means big boulder, big rock, bedrock, I will build my church. And so you are a little rock, but I will build my church on a rock. And so some people go, well, Peter himself is the rock, and that's what I'm going to build my church on, is, is you, Peter, this pebble, but you're going to be a big rock, and I'm going to build my church on you. Others say that it was Peter's confession that because he confessed Jesus as Lord, that that's the rock that I'm going to build my church on, that confession. Others say that Jesus is the rock, and he's going to build it on his teachings and who he is, because now he's been confessed as the Christ. And so there's a lot of different takes on it, and only slight differences within it. But if we say, hey, it's just Peter, and it's just his rock, we can you say there's... That's the, the grounding for having a pope, was that he was an anointed person to build the church. I say it's a bit of the first two. That it, the early church did start with Peter. It did start with him saying at the day of Pentecost and thousands coming to faith. And he was a big acting part in the early church. But the weight of it is not on him. I believe Jesus is saying here is that I'm going to build my church on you. But you're just one piece of a much larger foundation. 
one small piece, a pebble, of a larger foundation that I'm going to build my church on. And the pressure is not just on you. It's on all of us. Anyone who confesses Jesus as Lord, God's going to build his church on. And he's going to use us to do so. It's not down to an individual. It's down to all of us. We've all been given the task of going forth and making disciples. We've all been given the task of reconciling the world to God. We've all been given the task. Not just one person. But we do it together with different gifts and abilities. We are the church. Scripture doesn't say use that word too much, and it's only really used twice by Jesus. But the word church is ecclesia, the called out assembly, the called out group, the people that believe in God and Jesus, that gathering of believers. That's the church. It's not a building. It's not a place. It's not a shrine like the other gods. It's us. We are the church. We are the gathering of believers. In 1 Peter 2 verse 5, he says, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be, ho- to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. If we believe in Jesus as the Son of the living God, we are stones where God can use us to build his church. It says that he is the one that's building the church. It's not down to us. It's not just us as individuals. He's going to build his church and it's going to grow. And just like... The church is often called the body of Christ. That picture of growing. And so when I grew up, I uh, I stopped at about... I'm still growing up, I know some of you are thinking. But I grew until like 20 or whatever, and I stopped growing. And now, as I'm getting into my 30s, I'm growing in a different way, you know? (laughs) But we don't just grow bigger. We multiply. Anything natural multiplies. It grows. And so now I've got three kids. Lovely kids that wake us up really early, but lovely. And that's a natural progress of growth. And God is growing his church. The danger is that we grow, we get fat, we get complacent, and we don't do much. Which I'm tending to do sometimes. And not get around too much. He's growing his church. And that's us. The ecclesia. The gathering of believers. The called out ones. And the gates of Hades will not overcome us. Uh, That means that we're going to have attack. We're going to be in a war. But God's given us armor. Spiritual armor. We're going to be in the battle. And it's not against flesh and blood. We're going to be in a battle. I heard a preacher once say that if we wake up in the morning, we should run straight head on into conflict against the enemy. Otherwise, we might be running the wrong way. We're going to have conflict. Uh, I don't know if many of you have seen uh, Lord of the Rings. I really like that movie. It was really good. I can see some of you are addicts and have nodding quite a bit. But uh, there's one part that I really like. And uh, they've gone to this king and they've woken him up because he wasn't doing too great stuff. And he had like things on his eyes and whatever. wasn't seeing clearly. But the orcs and these like big dragon things are coming in. And uh, they're taking on the village nearby. And uh, the gathering of the guys are like, hey, we, we need to go out and, and confront them and take them head on. We need to take them out now is our opportunity. And the king says, no, we need to go to Helm's Deep, where we've always gone. We need to go back to these solid foundation where we, we're secure and we're safe behind big gates. And I, I sometimes thought of it like this when I read the passage, is that the 
hell is never going to get through those gates. It's never going to break down. And that in some way that we as a church have got this like boundary with gates in front of us. And actually, it's not that way around. Gates are a defense mechanism. They're meant to stop attack. When it says the gates of Hades, hell, it's not our gates. It's their gates. It's Satan's gates. We're meant to be charging the gates. And gates aren't scary things. They're not scary, hardcore attacking weapons. You don't hear of a terrorist holding up a plane with a gate. You don't go through the metal detectors in airports checking for gates. You don't have to have a license to have a gate. You know? You don't go into areas looking for gates of mass destruction. They're, they're, they're defense mechanisms. And we're meant to be charging them, and they're not going to prevail. We need to be going at them, not hiding behind them. And Jesus says that they're not, we're going to overcome them. They're not going to stand. We, as the living stones, are going to, as a church, as a gathering, are going to be on, on the attack, not on the defensive. On Wednesdays, we often have drop-in on, in this room here, and a lot of guys come in from the school. And we play a lot of games with them. And I sometimes play chess, but I'm not hot at chess at all. And I was playing against this like young 11-year-old, 12-year-old. And I was whipping him, as you do, and totally beating him. And he was down to like a couple little pieces left. And so it, it's that bit where you're just like popping around the board. And you're just trying to get him. And it's check, and then he moves, and then it's check, and then he moves. And I wasn't really paying attention. And he laid a trap, and he wiped out my queen. And I was like, no! <laughs> and all of a sudden, he was on the attack. And he was making me move around and taking me into check and moving me around. He moved from this defensive attitude to attack. And that's what we need to do as the gathering of believers in this nation. Because as a whole, the church in England's not doing great. But that doesn't mean we need to defend. We need to attack. Why? Because Jesus is the son of the living God. And he's building his church. And he's called us to make disciples. The early church, when they heard this, their response after Jesus ascended, was twofold. It was personal witness as they individually went around sharing their faith, and it was starting churches. Peter, his method was quite a unique one. Um, at the day of Pentecost, he stood up and he started his talk with saying, Hey, we're not drunk. Um, which is not the best way to start a, a sermon, if you've ever thought of that with your hearers. Hey, we're not drunk. And then he moves on to uh, just really insulting them and saying that you killed Jesus. And it's not like a really seeker-sensitive kind of sermon. It's not like the best model to start a church that he went on with. But um, from that, thousands came to faith. And those thousands met together and started a church. That was one model that he used to build his church. Stephen, he, uh, he got stoned. And I know you guys have got stones in your hands and you're thinking two things here. <laughs> okay, first off, just hold back. It's not that example that I'm trying to say here. But persecution drove the early church. It drove them out. They, they went on. People in that church that Peter planted went on. And um, they started sharing their faith, not just with the Jewish people, but also with the Hellenists. You can read about it in Acts 11. And um, 
they went to this place called Antioch, and they, they started, people started coming to faith. And then the church grew as a result of that. And um, that's how that model started, was persecution. That's how that church started. That sent people out. Not the apostles, not the great guys that had walked with Jesus forever. Other stones, other people that he's built his church with. Other people that had just recently been saved went out. And that church at Antioch sent Paul on his missionary journeys. He went out and started telling people about Jesus in different areas, different scenarios, using different methods each time. Sometimes it was just in the marketplace. Sometimes it was like with the great thinkers of the time. All different models. And and from that, he uh, started churches. And then he would raise leaders in those churches. And then he would let them lead and move on and plant other churches. And then raise leaders up who would lead. And then he would move on. And half the New Testament is a result of him writing back to those churches that he planted. Saying, hey, maybe you shouldn't do this, do this. God is with you. And encouraging them. That was his model. That's what he used. That's how God used him to build his church. There's loads of different models of how to plant churches or grow churches. And I'm not going to go through all the list here because it's just going to take forever and explain them all. But there's different models and different ways of doing it. And isn't that great? But, but generally we think of church planning, you need to get 40 people and we need to go to an area and start meeting there and that's a new congregation in a new area. And, and that's not the example that was used in the New Testament. It was loads of different ways of doing it. Loads of different actions and, and reaching out. So from Antioch, people left and went to Turkey and Africa where churches were formed. From Turkey and Africa, they went to Europe. And from Europe, they went to the colonies. And it spread through people building God's church. On the 6th of January, 1850, a 15-year-old boy who was meant to be going somewhere got caught in a snowstorm. And uh, instead of going to where he went, he took shelter in a primitive Methodist church that had started, a small one, in Colchester. And he gave his life. His name was Charles Spurgeon, who went on to plant hundreds of churches. In 1870, he sent a group of believers to Eastbourne, And they met together and started a church. That church was Salon Baptist Church, Salon Place Baptist Church, who went on. And they planted a church in Victoria Road. And they moved as they grew to Eldon Road and became this church where we gather we have all been affected by church planting. Whether by the early church or now. We've experienced our faith through people who have gone out and started churches. We've all been affected. Charles Spurgeon once said, As a Christian, either we're a missionary or we're an imposter. In other words, there's no such thing as a Christian that doesn't live on mission for the Lord. We're all on mission for the Lord. If we answer that question, who do we say Jesus is? We're on mission if we say he is Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Because he sends us out on mission. We are a sent people. He sends us out to go make disciples. He says, just as the Father sent me to seek and save the lost, 
I am sending you. I am sending you out for the ministry of reconciliation. I want my people to know me and worship me. I am sending you out and you're going to attack these gates and they're not going to stand. One of those colonies um, that I was talking about when it grew moved to South Africa. And a group of people met in a church. Well, met in a house. And they grew in their faith. And a couple of years later, they started this church in the middle of nowhere. And that church grew. And they, they moved on to a bigger building in a bit of a different place. And one of those members in that church came to a block of flats that he lived in, knocked on the door of one of the houses and said, hey, I'm going to church. Can I take your kids with, can I take your kids to Sunday school with me? And he did that for years. And my brother and sister went to church every Sunday and came to faith. And my mom came to faith as a result. And I came to faith as a result. And my dad later on came to faith as a result of an individual in a body of believers that went out. I am a result of church planting. My faith is a result of church planting. Which leaves us to a very exciting thing. That Victoria Baptist Church is going to be planting a church. It's a different model. It's not, we're not sending 40 people off. Jess and I are going to hopefully be leading a group. And uh, we're hoping to go to Brighton. And I know it seems quite a far way away. But the reddish map indicates that there's great spiritual need there. That's a, a scale there of people that on a census voted to say what their religion, what their religious status was or what they believed. And 0 to 40% of people within a postcode, if it's red, say that they, that, that have no faith, they don't believe in a God. They are non-Christian, sorry. Actually, that's how it says, it's non-Christian. That's not that they don't believe in a God, it's that they are just not Christian. 0 to 40% of people within Brighton. And, and it's that's a lot of Brighton if you see that red. Also, Brighton is, has high social needs. It's, it's an area of great deprivation. Those purple spots on a scale show areas of high deprivation. And when we're saying high, it's like in the bottom 5% of England of places to live with deprivation. Deprivation is met, rated on crime, unemployment, schooling, health. These kind of things pull them together. And so Brighton's got great spiritual need, great social need, and it's a dense population with few churches that are trying to meet that need. So what are we going to do? The hope is, is that we, we go there, we move in, we don't pull away, and uh, we live in the area. We be incarnational. And as a community, we, we bond together. We study scripture together. We do life and life together. We come tight together as we grow as disciples in God. The focus is that we want to make disciples in a church plant. That go on to make disciples. People that will go on to plant churches and do different things. We want to be a passionate community, but we also want to serve. If James says, unless our faith brings us to action, it doesn't matter anything. So part of the reason we want to go there, we, we want to go to an area that we can serve and get stuck in and get dirt under our fingernails. Like real hands-on ministry within people that are in desperate need. And in doing that, we, we hope to make friendships. And share our faith with them. And tell them about Jesus. We, we're hoping to be good news. 
So we've decided that we're going to call this um, church plant, church starting, this missionary action, whatever you want to call it, good news. Because together we want to experience and explore the good news of God and of Jesus together. We want to be to good news to those around us as we serve. And we want to share the good news of Christ as he builds his church. And we're all a part of it. Currently, we have a couple of partners. Stewardship is a, a giving organization that helps organize funds. VBC, us, our partners, we're on this journey together. Southeast Baptist Association are hoping to plant 10 churches by 2020, and this being one of them. I'm also in talks with uh, a group called Urban Expression who focus on um, ministering it into areas of high need and deprivation within cities. And they've been doing it for 15 years, so we want to try and partner with them and learn as much as we can from them. And I'm not saying that this is the only way that we are living stones, that we can get involved. Because we've just heard there's Spinnaker, there's different schools work, there's the people that stood up for, for Sunday school. We're all actively involved in building God's church. But this is a, another part of it. It's reaching out to those that don't know it. We're all living stones, and we need each other to do this. It doesn't come to just one person. And that's why I've given you stones, not to throw them at me. Just to be clear. <laughs> Fair enough, glad we got that. There's different ways we can get involved in this. Well, we need prayer. This, this project needs prayer. We're going into a highly spiritual area that's not just a um, nice spiritual area. We're going into opposition. We need prayer. We need financial support to help this happen. And that's why we've linked up with stewardship so that e giving is easier to get this done. We need people to come and do this. If God's put this on your heart or if this excites you, I, pray, I ask you to just pray about it and seek God about this and then contact us and we'll have a chat. Otherwise, we've made a strategic plan of how we intend to go a part of this. And you can either get that on the church website under my bio of Neil and staff or I've printed out a couple of copies by, I've made like a notice board thing outside there and you can grab one of those and read up more about it and get more informed to see if this is something you would like to do. But my point is, is that we need to be going out. We can't just be staying in and getting fat like me. God's called us to be a part of building his church. Who do we say he is? Because our answer to that leads us to our actions of what we do. Let me close and pray quickly.